G'day, I'm Josh Robinson, and welcome to my barn dominion. So I grew up in Australia. Uh, I started drifting about 14 years ago. And before that I was driving rally cars and circuit racing or time attack in Australia uh, until I made the decision that I wanted to compete in the pro series for drifting, which is Formula Drift in the US. I competed in Japan for five years until I earned my Formula Drift license. And then I moved over here five years ago and that takes me to here. All right, let's talk about this place. Obviously, this is, to the, to the uninitiated first up, it just looks like the ultimate man cave, but this is a base of operations, this is a workshop, this is a place for business for the drift school. Talk, talk us, I guess, what's the purpose of this place that we're in and how does that also control what people can't see here, which is your drift school as well? Sure, so the foundation for this place was I needed somewhere to live in the US and also needed somewhere to uh, work on my cars and prepare them for Formula Drift and everything else that we have going on. Uh, rents are really high in the US, so having a standalone workshop and a standalone house is super expensive. And they have this thing in the States called a barn dominium, which is basically you get a barn and you build a condom, condo or condominium inside of it, like an apartment in Australia. Uh, and then you have the best of both worlds, which is a workshop with a house inside of it. Uh, so that's how I can afford this place is because it's basically my work from home office. So four years ago, I started Texas Drift Academy. Uh, back then we would just rent racetracks from uh, other vendors basically. And then the opportunity came up a year and a half ago for me to take over the track that we were uh, formerly subleasing. And so the, the basis for starting the Drift Academy was I needed some practice cars. And so we built two identical Nissan or Nissan 350Zs or Zs. Being bilingual is difficult for an Australian audience these days. Uh, so we, so I bought two salvage title 350Zs and built those into two identical cars so I could go and practice for Formula Drift with my friends. And since you don't practice seven days a week, I was like, well, I've got these cars sitting around. Maybe I can teach some friends how to drift. And so I started doing that and then other people wanted to learn how to drift and so the Drift Academy kind of became what it is today. Uh, now we have eight staff and a 140 acre racetrack, one hour south of Austin and about 20 minutes north of San Antonio here in Texas. And that has now expanded even further. Ice drifting, you've got YouTubers, you've got celebrities, you've got T-Pain, you've got like, tell us about that side of it. Yeah, we definitely get people from all walks of life through. Uh, right through from uh, Formula One, Formula Drift, NASCAR, world champions, you name it. Uh, right through to rappers, musicians of all backgrounds, as you've mentioned, T-Pain. Uh, all the way down to the 16 year old kid that had their parents just bought them a, a nice gift for graduating high school or for spring break. Man, the craziest thing is I never even saw snow until I was 20 years old. And so <laughs> it's fairly ridiculous that we now run the largest ice drifting program in the world. Uh, so every year we pack up a bunch of the Drift Academy cars and we send them to the frozen lakes in Minnesota. Uh, we have a 10,000 acre lake that's about an hour outside of Minneapolis. And this year we sent up eight of our cars, plus all the support vehicles, trucks, the Jeep for towing people out of snowbanks. We have side-by-sides, everything. It's a, we basically take over the city. Uh, we have an Airbnb, we have four apartments, two heated workshops. It's absolute chaos. It's a very small town. Uh, they're very welcoming to foreigners, fortunately, because there's a lot of us that come through and we have guests flying from all over the world to come and experience driving on a frozen lake. I think I need to do that, eh? Seriously, that actually sounds way too fun. You absolutely do. It's honestly <laughs> the most fun you'll ever have in a car. All right, let's talk about this place. We'll do a quick tour. Let's sort of like work our way that way and end at the stories of the cars last. Let's start at the Porsche. Only because I love Porsche GT3 RS. Let's start there. <laughs> it's a Porsche GT3 RS. <laughs> what do you say about factory cars? It's white and it has a black hood. <laughs> it's made from carbon. Stop talking it down. Come on, come on. Uh, so this whole area is basically uh, a bar and a lounge area. Eventually when I get around to landscape in the backyard, which will hopefully be in the spring, uh, you can kind of see there's a fire pit and things outside, which is actually from the end of a uh, petrol tanker from a, from a truck. Uh, the bar itself is made from a 20 foot high cube shipping container. 
Uh, we made that just by cutting out the side of it and soon we'll have shelves and things in there. I should probably preface everything in here in that I only just moved in here in September and then October I had SEMA, November was drift week, December I went home for the first time in three years, January, February we have ice drifting and this is really our first week back here. So like <laughs> when we get in the back, it's a freaking disaster zone uh, just cause it's literally our first week here like sorting stuff out, so cut me a break. Basically it's a 20 foot shipping container as the whole building is. Uh, the one up the top just for scale is a 40 foot high cube shipping container and that has three offices inside it. Uh, upstairs and what you can kind of see at the top there is two guest bedrooms and there's another master bedroom and a couple of bathrooms up there as well. And the theory for that is that when I have guys like yourself or my team or anyone else in from out of town, they've got somewhere to stay. The US is a huge place and sometimes it's difficult to find the talent that you need. Uh, locally, particularly being in Austin, Texas, there's not a huge motorsport capital compared to other places in the US. So we always have guys flying in to do work and got crazy stuff going on, whether it's YouTubers or you name it. So it's always great to have somewhere in-house that we can house people um, and just show them a good time while they're out here. Uh, so back here is where some of the prep is done for the Drift Academy cars. Uh, as I said before, we run Alamo City Motorplex and so we also have workshops, everything down there as well. This car has just come back from ice drifting, uh, so it's getting a bunch of major work done before it goes back into circulation for the Drift Academy. Uh, there's a 350Z behind us here that has just come in, and that one we're actually building for a YouTuber and a good friend of mine, Weston Champlin, and we're going to be doing an LS swap on that uh, car, and that one actually needs to be finished in the next eight weeks before LS Fest. And as you can see, uh, it hasn't been started yet, so it's gonna be a busy eight weeks. <laughs> Hang on, eight weeks, full build, while building this place, and a Formula Drift program, and a Drift Academy, and thrashing the McLaren. Yeah, don't get much sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're like me. Sleep is, <laughs> sleep is not even an option, let alone being optional. We don't, we, that's it. Go, 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 right? Everything. It's a tricky one, man, for sure. Uh, I definitely work a ton. There's no doubt about it. And I'm gonna make a video about this kind of soonish because I think it's an interesting story. Basically, my most popular video on the internet at the moment is how I lost all of my money <laughs> <laughs> and like why pro drifting is a bad idea. I mean, I, I, I did okay in the end, but it was a freaking wild ride. Uh, so this place is very much my comeback story. <laughs> when I first put in the offer to buy the land in 2020, it was at a very interesting time in the world. I literally had $3,000 to my name. I was sleeping in my truck between rounds of Formula Drift. Uh, I didn't have a social security number, didn't have a credit score or anything. So it's been a freaking trip to go from that to now having somewhere that I can call home. Mate, I join you because I've slept in my car before. <laughs> <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do. Gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> Everyone's gonna wanna know, why is there a random McLaren parked in the middle? <laughs> uh because i like the color blue <laughs> <laughs> you and supercars so are shocking <laughs> <laughs> uh no so i think we should definitely cut to this getting loaded onto a truck <laughs> in like an hour when the truck driver gets here so this thing arrived from the dealer on monday i put two miles on it and it now has uh, the knock sensors have gone bad on the engine and it blew a coolant line. So it's, it got here on Monday, that happened on Thursday and today is Tuesday, it's now going back to McLaren. McLaren reliability right there. Just go like this. <laughs> Actually, this is going to be some wall art. This is like various parts of damage to uh, my Z from ice drifting and Lone Star Drift and all the other fun stuff that we do. So this is going to be some wall art that we eventually, or very soon, bolt up. That's why it's kind of getting assembled at the moment. And this is actually one of the tires that we use for ice drifting. They have 380 tungsten studs in each tire. Uh, they're super, super sharp when they're brand new. Like if you touch your hand on it like that, it will literally cut your hand open. And this is one that's heavily worn out and you can see the studs have started to work their way loose and fall out. That's pretty crazy. So there's half a Z. <laughs> and a shipping container with toilets. Yep, so in here, <laughs> yeah, in here we've got a shower and two toilets for the guys, just a general restroom area. So I guess my oldest car here would be uh, my Lancer. So it's a two-door Mitsubishi Lancer, started life as a 1.5 litre naturally aspirated front wheel drive car. Uh, we converted it to all wheel drive by cutting out the floor pan of an Evo and gluing it in there. 
and then put an engine out of an Evo 7 in it. It's got a um, Evo green turbo on it, makes almost 400 all horsepower. And of course it's kind of unique because it's a two door Evo, which Mitsubishi never made, unlike the Subaru 22B. And what was it used for and where? Obviously, some people don't realize it's actually Australian, like it was used in Australia. Like, what was it used for and where? This is my Tarmac Rally car. So that's, this is the oldest car that I have from my motorsport history. I had an Evo before, a couple of Evos before that, but this is the, the oldest one that I still have. As you said, it's right-hand drive, it's fully caged. Uh, and this is, yeah, how I got my start in motorsport, basically. And I still, it's followed me all over the world. I don't think I'll ever part with it. In terms of order, I guess this is next, right? Uh, yeah, so this is uh, the AMS Performance built Blue Demon Evo. Uh, it has 650 all horsepower Boltex Cyber Evo body kit. All the go fast bits that you'd expect for a, a modern time attack car. Now, this was built here, then shipped back to Australia. Now it's back in America. Run, run us through how that worked. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, so I brought this out to Australia in 2008, and then it stayed with me uh, for what, almost nine years in Australia and then it came and then I brought it back to the US again uh, when I had my old workshop down the street from here and then I brought it over here when this was finished at the end of last year. All right let's get to something really Aussie. Let's, let's, show, <laughs> let's, pr let's prove you're still Australian. So this was my original Formula Drift Ute. This is what I got my start in the US with, what I got my first podium uh, in Formula Drift with. It's a thousand horsepower uh, supercharged LS engine. Uh, it has a, a one-off carbon fiber body, so we actually had to make the molds for the carbon doors and the body and everything else because I guess no one was silly enough before me to think that was a good idea. <laughs> so uh, we'll go down the back and I'll show you the rest of it. It's got a, a VF, VF supercar front bumper, the fenders are factory, and then down the back I'll show you the rest of it. So this is it, as I said, it's got a full carbon body. Uh, to make the molds off this was quite a challenge. We had to get a forklift and lift it up to about 45 degrees, put supports underneath it, and then basically start to lay the fiberglass molds over it for this and for all the doors. And then from there, pull the molds, made a plug, and then made the carbon body from there. Because the biggest issue was, we had to get it down to kind of being the correct weight for formula drift, which is very, very difficult in a vehicle that's like over 4,000 pounds from the factory. And we needed to be almost half that. The minimum weight with the driver is 2,900 pounds, which is not a lot when your vehicle is <laughs> almost double that to start with. Uh, we got dealt a rough hand, I guess you could say. After we finished building this and we put it in the container to send it to the US, while it was on the way over here, they changed the regulations for the championship where previously you could run up to a 315 tire uh, and then they changed the rules to being only a 255. So the vehicle was always going to be heavy, we knew that, but because of that weight, we could be, run a larger tire to compensate for it. And then when it was coming to the States, they changed that rule literally while it was on the boat, but the money had been spent and we had to, to come and campaign it regardless. And I mean, it was what it was. We still had some good results, but it was a challenge for sure. And that led to a new car, right? That's right, we'll head this way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I know this car well for obvious reasons. Yeah, that's right, from SEMA, that was a good time. Thank you. HGK E92 Eurofighter. Uh, my team built it. We had guys come from all over the place, mainly Houston, but from other parts of the country as well uh, to help build it because it's a, a team effort with something like this. It has a thousand horsepower Texas Speed built motor. It runs a 250 shot of nitrous and has a PPG sequential transmission, a full Duralast catalog of accessories and sensors to support that. And of course, the classic HGK carbon Kevlar body. How does it feel going to being an Aussie to a, you're an Australian living in Texas that was driving an Australian ute. That kind of seemed pretty good. But now you're an Australian living in Texas driving a European car with a, the most American looking motor on earth. Like this, how did, did you ever, did you ever think five years ago, 
no, I just would never end up here. Like, what's? How did that combination? How does it feel to stand back and look at that and go, "How did I get here?" <laughs> Man, I look back at it and just go, "That's a lot of sleepless nights." <laughs> like, there is nothing linear or straightforward about this uh, about this process. I can assure you. Uh, definitely getting to drive an E92 was was a huge step up in terms of the competi- or the competitiveness of that platform. Having a chassis where you can actually play around with grip levels because in the ute it was just always full kill like it was a real challenge for us trying to get traction to keep up with something as light as an s chassis and something like the ute with a 255 wide tire was not a good time uh so it was definitely enjoyable to go to a platform that was light enough and had the technology in it that you could actually start to dial in uh suspension setups that were something other than everything she's got I was going to talk to you about this car, but you seem to be terrible at talking about exotic and supercars. It's red. <laughs> oh, and it's got a black interior. <laughs> uh, man, the thing is with cars like that is that, what do you say about it? It's just like, I don't know, it's a, a car. If you're stupid enough to write the check, then there it is. Whereas to me, stuff that you build yourself is way more interesting. Everything here's got a story. And the most absurd thing is like my two favorite cars that I, I don't think we've even talked about yet are actually parked outside. They're both like under $10,000. They're both salvage title vehicles. But just the memories that are attached to those with like the people that I've met and the experiences I've had far outweigh anything else that's in this workshop. Uh, yeah, my 350Z, that's the one that uh, I started the Drift Academy with, went to Saudi Arabia with, uh, with Hoonigan, and then went ice drifting for the first time. And just like the places that's taken me and the people that I've met far outweigh like any shiny thing in here. So like to me, that holds a lot of weight. And the same thing with the Jeep. That was a $6,000 purchase from the, the auctions. Had a bunch of damage on it, fixed it up. And now I've gone all over the country with a bunch of friends and getting to see the stuff that you don't get to see when you're just hustling all the time to get to racetracks to compete in Formula Drift. Like to me, going to like see the back roads of Arizona and the mountains in Colorado and stuff is honestly being like one of the highlights of being in the US. All right, talk us through outside. There's a lot to look at out here as well, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the idea is that the driveway is a replica of my two favorite racetracks from Japan. One is Manami at Ibisu, and the other one is Nishi Short Short. Uh, this is where we do a, a bit of testing before cars go to the track if we're in a bind. Predominantly it's used for blasting around with crazy carts when I have friends in town. Uh, there's also a full drive track as well. The full drive track came about because during construction we had to dig out a lot of limestone rocks. Basically all of Texas and particularly this part is just one big limestone slab. And so the trucking company was like, oh, we want $6,000 to like, take away all these rocks. And I was like, hell no, I'm not paying $6,000 to cut off these rocks. And so we just built our own mountain out the front. And now I've got a pretty rowdy full drive track. That's the alternate entrance to the property if you don't want to drive up the drift track slash driveway. <laughs> All right, I think the best way to end this feature is to tell everyone that we, we probably need to, like everyone keeps hearing about this track, we should probably go do something with it, right? <laughs> Yeah, when in doubt, power out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think a good way to wrap this is to take you guys for a quick thrash around the driveway and send you off in a blaze of glory. Mm-hmm.